Are you looking to build your brand or grow your business online? Then look no further than today's fantastic sponsor, Squarespace. The all-in-one platform that helps you create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and even sell products and services. One feature that I really love about Squarespace is member areas. It's perfect for creators and educators who want to monetize their expertise by selling access to gated content like classes, online courses, newsletters, or whatever. Another great feature is email campaigns. You can create beautiful, customized email templates that match your website's branding, and you can easily collect email subscribers to convert them into law customers. With built-in analytics, you can see how effective your campaigns are, which is useful. Squarespace also makes it easy to support your favorite causes by collecting donations via PayPal, Apple Pay, Stripe, and Venmo. It's a great way to make a difference in your community or around the world. And with Squarespace's in-depth website analytics tools, you can gain powerful insights into who's visiting your site, or where they're coming from, and what they're interested in. It's an invaluable tool for growing your online presence. With Squarespace's powerful blogging tools, you can also share your stories, photos, videos, and updates with your audience and with the ability to categorize, share, and schedule your posts, you can make your content work for you. And last but not least, Squarespace's social media integrations allow you to display your social media posts on your website and automatically push your website content to your favorite social media channels. It's a great way to keep your followers engaged. So what are you waiting for? Head to squarespace.com and start your free trial today. And when you're ready to launch, don't forget to use my promo code BRAINFOOD at squarespace.com slash BRAINFOOD to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now, today's video. Along with perfect gun silencers, instant knockout gas, and soft non-body shredding window glass, Truth Serum is a favorite tool of many an action and adventure writer, a convenient contrivance that neatly sidesteps the limitations of real physics and human biology and helps move the story right along. But does this notional substance have any bases in reality? Are there actually drugs out there that can make even the most mentally disciplined interrogation subject freely spill their guts? Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, the short answer is no. However, as is often the case with such potentially useful substances, that's not for lack of trying. So how close are we to making a real-life truth serum? Perhaps the oldest truth serum on record is plain old ethyl alcohol. The tongue-loosening properties of wine and beer have been known about since antiquity, inspiring the famous Latin phrase often attributed to Roman writer Pliny the Elder, in vino veritas, in wine there is truth. However, the modern notion of truth serum did not emerge until the early 20th century and grew out of a once popular medical practice. As covered in our previous video, Twilight Sleep, the horrifying way in which early 20th century women gave birth, obstetricians in the early 1900s would often inject women going into labor with a combination of morphine and scopolamine, a drug derived from plants of the nightshade family such as henbane and jimson weed. This combination induced a hypnotic state known as twilight sleep, which was supposed to relieve the trauma of childbirth. In practice, however, this procedure often resulted in violent delirium, requiring mothers to be strapped to their beds as well as total amnesia of the whole birthing process. Among the many practitioners of twilight sleep, in the United States was Dr. Robert Ernest House, who ran a small obstetrical practice in the town of Ferris, Texas in the 1910s. During one home delivery, he observed a curious event. My attention was first attracted to this peculiar phenomenon September the 7th, 1916, while conducting a case of labor under the influence of scopolamine. We desired to weigh the baby and inquired for the scales. The husband stated he could not find them. The wife, apparently sound asleep, spoke up and said, they're in the kitchen on the nail behind the picture. The fact that this woman suffered no pain and did not remember when her child was delivered yet could answer correctly a question she had overheard appealed to me so strongly that I decided to ascertain if that in reality was another function of scopolamine. Of other patients similarly medicated, House reported, at certain stages of the anesthesia, they will reply to all questions propounded with a childlike simplicity, with childlike honesty, without evasiveness, guilt, deceit, or fraud. As a result of these observations, House began to wonder if the drug made it impossible to lie, and whether this effect could be potentially used in criminal investigations. Interestingly, House did not propose using scopolamine to prove someone's guilt, the use with which we commonly associate truth serum today, but instead to confirm their innocence. To this end, he arranged to administer the drug to a group of prisoners in the Dallas County Jail, figuring that as these men were already incarcerated, they had nothing left to hide. As a result of House's interviews, two prisoners were found to have seemingly been falsely convicted and were eventually acquitted and released. Throughout the 1920s, the use of scopolamine in criminal investigations spread across the United States, playing a key role in a number of high-profile cases, including a 1919 string of axe murders in Birmingham, Alabama, and a 1931 securities heist in Chicago. However, the more the drug was used, the less reliable it was found to be. For instance, in 1928, Frederick Jameson, son of prominent Hawaiian banker Frederick Jameson, uh, was kidnapped and murdered in Waikiki. The prime suspect, the Jameson's chauffeur, Harry Kyson, was arrested and injected with scopolamine, under whose 
influence, he confessed to writing the ransom note. Once the drug wore off, however, he denied any involvement in the crime. Another scopolamine session only produced further denials. Shortly thereafter, the real killer, hotel employee Miles Fukunaga, was apprehended, convicted, and hanged, and Kaisen was released. These and other failures fueled a growing mistrust of scopolamine among legal professionals, culminating in a 1926 investigation of the drug's use by Judge Robert Walker Franklin. When questioned on how his alleged truth serum actually worked, Robert House, who was neither a psychologist nor a pharmacologist, explained that the auditory nerve sends a question to that part of the brain where the answer is stored for future use, and the brain sends the answer to the nerve of the tongue. When a person is asked his name, his willpower can prevent the tongue from articulating the name, and the power of reason can also make the tongue tell a lie, but when the willpower and the power to reason are removed, the replies are automatic. In response to this confusing and fanciful answer, Judge Franklin dismissed the utility of scopolamine outright, castigating House and its advocates as credulous folk who believe in the magic powers of filters, potions, and cures by faith. I mean, tell us how you really feel, Judge. Despite this, scopolamine continued to be used by a handful of American police departments well into the 1930s. Indeed, the mere threat of being interrogated under its influence was enough to get many suspects to confess. By the end of the decade, however, scopolamine had fallen out of favor due to its unpleasant side effects, including a painfully dry mouth and hallucinations, and was largely replaced by barbiturate sedatives like sodium amatol and sodium theopental. The next major period of truth serum development took place during the Second World War, and once again these developments were inspired by more benevolent medical procedures. During the war, sedatives like amatol were commonly given to soldiers to reduce battlefield anxiety. But when these drugs were given to soldiers suffering from shell shock or battle fatigue, aka post traumatic stress disorder, psychiatrists discovered that it made them more willing to open up about their traumatic experiences, making the application of regular psychoanalytic techniques far easier. Such observations led to the post-war development of the so-called Amatol interview, a practice today known as narcoanalysis. Unsurprisingly, these techniques soon came to the attention of intelligence agencies like the United States Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, who began investigating the use of various psychoactive substances for the interrogation of spies. Among the various substances studied by the OSS were barbiturates, scopolamine, the hallucinogen mescaline, better known as peyote, and a liquid cannabis extract codenamed TD, which was found to, quote, relax all inhibitions and to deaden the areas of the brain which govern an individual's discretion and caution. The sense of humor is accentuated to the point where any statement or situation can become extremely funny to the subject. In 1943, OSS narcotics agent George H. White decided to field test TD on one August Little Augie de Gracio, a New York drug kingpin with connections to the infamous mob boss Charles Luciano. During their meeting, White offered cigarettes laced with TD to de Gracio, who proceeded to get as high as a kite and spill his guts, revealing the full extent and organization of his drug trafficking network. While this result was encouraging, a second interview was rather less successful, with de Gracio getting so stoned that he fell asleep before he could divulge any useful information. Undeterred, the OSS tried again on 30 Americans suspected of being communists, succeeding in extracting confessions from five of them. However, the first live test on an enemy agent, in this case a German U-boat captain, ended in farce when the interrogator accidentally smoked one of the TD Lay cigarettes and began drunkenly ranting about his boss making passes at his wife. So, whoopsie doodle. After this, the OSS made no further use of TD, having concluded that it was no more effective than alcohol in extracting confessions. Other intelligence agencies, however, like the German Gestapo, continued to use sedatives like scopolamine for interrogations. This use is depicted in many works of post-war fiction, like the 1957 novel and 1961 film The Guns of Navarone, helping to popularize the use of truth serum in the action, adventure, and spy genres. As the Second World War gave way to the Cold War, the need for enhanced interrogation techniques like truth serums gained new urgency. This urgency was spurred by reports that American POWs captured during the Korean War were being given various substances like barbiturates and amphetamines to get them to talk. As Army Lieutenant John Ory told a journalist upon his release, I found myself talking and talking. I was hardly able to control what I was saying. I talked to Blue Streak. At first, the CIA used old standbys like scopolamine and sodium amatol on suspected Soviet spies, often pairing it with caffeine or amphetamines to prevent the subject from falling asleep. Despite its unfortunate side effects, scopolamine was especially preferred because it induced complete amnesia, leaving the subject with no memory of interrogation. However, in 1948, Richard Kuhn, a German biochemist, was brought to the United States as part of Operation Paperclip, and he informed his handlers of a powerful hallucinogen developed in 1938 by Swiss pharmaceutical firm Sandoz, which could severely incapacitate to confuse a subject, making them extremely pliable. 
The drug was lysergic acid diethylamide, better known as LSD. In 1953, the CIA launched a series of studies on the use of LSD in interrogation as part of its infamous MKUltra program. Unregulated and grossly unethical, the MKUltra LSD experiments saw dozens of unsuspecting test subjects, both military and civilian, dosed with LSD without their consent or knowledge, while CIA agents recorded the results. These tests reached their crescendo in November 1953, when Frank Olson, a bacteriologist expert working for the U.S. Army at Camp Dietrich, Maryland, was secretly dosed with LSD by Sidney Gottlieb, head of the MKUltra program. Olson, disturbed and disaffected by his work on biological weapons, had become increasingly paranoid and agitated and had threatened several times to quit his job. Following his dosing, this paranoia grew ever more severe until in the early morning hours of November 28, 1953, Olsen plummeted from the 10th story of the New York City Stalter Hilton Hotel, dying shortly after impact. The exact circumstances of Olsen's death remain a mystery to this day, with some believing he committed suicide and others alleging he was murdered to prevent him from blowing the whistle on MK Ultra. And he was not the only victim of the shadowy program. Eleven months earlier, on January 8, 1953, American tennis player Harold Bauer was injected with the psychedelic drug methylenidioxamphetamine, or MDA, while undergoing treatment for depression at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. The injection triggered a violent epileptic seizure that killed Bauer within minutes. Dozens more unsuspecting victims would have had their mental health irreversibly damaged by the psychic driving experiments of British psychiatrist Ewan Cameron, who used large doses of sedative drugs and electroconvulsive therapy to brainwash and reshape his patients, but... Well, that's a story for another video. Yet despite shattering so many lives and the American public's trust in the government, MKUltra accomplished very little of real value. Like all earlier truth serums, LSD proved only marginally useful as an interrogation tool. More often than not, the drug produced such powerful hallucinations and delusions that the subject disappeared into fantasy, babbling incoherently and divulging no useful information. Indeed, this is a problem common to all supposed truth serums. At a psychological level, sedatives like sodium amytal reduce the speed at which the brain receives signals from the rest of the body. In theory, this makes performing high-level cognitive tasks more difficult, making it harder for a subject to concentrate and think up a lie. Many of these drugs also induce complete amnesia, preventing the subject from recognizing that they're being or have been interrogated. For this reason, scopolamine is sometimes used as a date-rape drug or to assist in robberies. The latter is a particularly common practice in Colombia, where thieves will dose a mark with scopolamine either by slipping it into their drink or blowing it into their face, then make the now drugged and pliable victim empty their bank account. The effects of hypnotic drugs, especially in the context of psychiatric narcoanalysis, were described as followed by psychologists William Sargent and Elliot Slater in 1944. It is commonplace that under the influence of alcohol, a man reveals tendencies that remain hidden in everyday life and may become suggestible, obstinate, euphoric, or boastful. Tongues are loosened by drink, critical judgment is suspended, and secret aspirations, damaging confessions, and dramatic falsifications of previous events come pouring out. Psychiatry has taken a trick and turned it into a technique. But what is now sometimes graced with the high-sounding title of narcoanalysis is no more than the method employed from time immemorial by the colonel in the mess to discover the qualities of the newest subaltern. Instead of alcohol, whose effects take some time to produce, are unreliable and difficult to control, we now employ a barbiturate to which those objections do not apply. But the effects are much the same. Both in the normal, the neurotic, and the psychotic, the drug abolishes inhibitions and allows underlying thought processes and preoccupations to appear. In addition, if there is much associated anxiety, this is partly at least abolished. Under the influence of a suitable dose, the retarded depressive may become free, able to talk, and even cheerful. There is reduction of the critical sense, an enhancement of rapport, and often a pouring out of both truth and fantasy equally. Aggressive feelings, which would terrify the individual in his normal state, can be expressed without excessive anxiety, and the emotional experiences of the past can be lived anew without disturbances of the autonomic equilibrium. Indeed, under certain circumstances, these drugs can work exactly as intended. In 2013, as part of the BBC documentary Pain, Pus and Poison, British TV presenter Michael Mosley allowed himself to be injected with two different doses of sodium theopentol and subjected to a series of questions. When asked what he did for a living, Mosley, despite fighting back fits of giggles, managed to lie that he was a world famous heart surgeon. But when the dose was increased, he immediately responded, I'm a television producer. Well, executive producer. Well, presenter. Some mix of the three of them. Upon coming up from the effects from the drug, Mosley reported that it simply hadn't occurred to him to lie, so he didn't. However, the dis 
disassociation and disorientation that should theoretically make drugs like sodium theopentyl ideal truth serums are also their Achilles heel. This feeling of inhibition and closeness with the interrogator can often lead the subject to babble on about every subject imaginable and tell the interrogator what they think they want to hear, whether true or not. Thus the problem becomes not too little information, but too much, with the interrogator having to sift through reams of irrelevant babble to find any useful information. Sedatives and hypnotics also tend to make subjects highly suggestible, making them vulnerable to manipulation by the interrogator and the creation of false memories. One of the most high-profile examples of this effect involves Evan Chandler, who in 1993 accused pop singer Michael Jackson of sexually abusing his 13-year-old son, Jordan Chandler. When the case was ultimately settled out of court, one key detail largely left out of the media discourse at the time was that Jordan Chandler never made any accusations against Jackson until his father, a dentist, gave him sodium amatol during a tooth extraction. While the exact facts of the case remain unknown, it is entirely possible that Jordan Chandler's memories of sexual abuse were entirely fabricated while under the influence of a sedative. Truth serums share this flaw with regular hypnosis, which throughout the 1970s and 80s was widely used to extract repressed memories and build more detailed legal testimonies. However, since the revelation that many of these supposedly repressed memories were in fact falsely constructed, the use of testimony given under hypnosis has been highly restricted by US courts. Furthermore, as Mosley's experiment demonstrates, uh, with sufficient preparation and mental discipline, a person can still overcome the effects of sedatives and hypnotics and fabricate answers. Indeed, controlled studies of purported truth serums have revealed that people are able to lie just as effectively while on these drugs than off them. And even if a 100% reliable truth serum were developed, its use may well be banned under any number of legal precedents. For example, in 1963, the US Supreme Court ruled the testimony obtained via truth serum violated the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination and was thus constitutionally inadmissible in court. Prior to this, very few convictions had ever been obtained with the help of psychoactive drugs, perhaps the highest profile being that of Raymond Cartier, who was executed in San Diego in 1960 after being convicted of killing his wife in a drunken rage. Internationally, truth serum may also be a violation of one's right to freedom from degrading treatment under the European Convention on Human Rights and a violation of the Inter-American Convention to Prevent and Punish Torture. But such legal rulings have done little to stop some pushing for a truth serum renaissance. Following the 9-11 attacks, for example, former CIA and FBI director William Webster suggested using drugs like sodium theopental to extract information from suspected terrorists. Since the Geneva Convention bans the use of such techniques on prisoners of war, the Bush administration pushed to have terrorists classified as illegal combatants and not POWs, freeing them from this restriction. On the civilian side of things, in 2013, Colorado judge William Sylvester approved the use of truth serum in the interrogation of James Holmes, who shot and killed 24 people and injured 70 in a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado in July 2012. The use of the drug was intended not to extract a confession from Holmes, but rather to determine if he was of sound mind and if a plea of insanity was justified. Nonetheless, the decision was widely criticized by the U.S. legal establishment, especially given the potential ramifications for Fifth Amendment rights. In the end, however, Holmes was convicted of all charges and sentenced to 12 consecutive life sentences, with truth serum playing no part in the proceedings. Farther afield, one of the few countries to regularly use truth serum as part of criminal investigations is India, which has used the technique in several high-profile cases. These include the 2006 Noida serial murders in which businessman Marinda Singh Bandir and his servant Surinder Kohli lured and killed up to 17 children, and the 2008 Mumbai massacre in which 175 people were killed and 300 injured by Pakistani terrorists. Nor has the search ended for the next generation of potential truth serums. In 2004, the independent Russian newspaper Novaya Gazeta reported that the Soviet KGB and its Russian Federation successor, the FSB, had developed a colorless, odorless, and tasteless substance codenamed SP-117, which could be slipped into a target's drink and render them disorientated and highly pliable within 15 minutes. According to dissident and FSB defector Alexander Litvinenko, who was murdered by the Russian government in 2016 using radioactive polonium-210, SP-117 was used in the February 2004 kidnapping of opposition politician Ivan Rybkin, in which he was drugged, abducted for four days, and blackmailed with an incriminating sex tape. While the exact formulation of SP-117 has never been revealed, another potential candidate for the next generation of truth serums is oxytocin, the so-called love hormone often given to expectant mothers to induce labor or promote lactation. As oxytocin is known to promote trust and bonding between humans, in 2005, a team from the University of Zurich, led by Michael Kosfeld, conducted experiments to determine the strength of this chemically induced bond. Participants were made to play a game in which they had to trust their opponents to transfer back a portion of their winnings. One group of participants was given oxytocin 
oxytocin, while the other was given a placebo. As expected, the participants given oxytocin were more trusting and transferred more of their winnings than the control group, with 45% transferring all of their winnings. This suggests that oxytocin might potentially be useful in interrogations by building a sense of trust between the subject and the interrogator. But for now, the dream of a perfect truth serum remains that. A dream. As Gordon H. Barland, a former captain in the U.S. Army Combat Development Command's intelligence agency in the 1960s and an expert on interrogation, states, I would have expected that if there was some sort of truth drug in general use, I would have heard rumors of it. I never did. Mark Wheelis, an expert on biological warfare at the University of California, Davis, is more cautiously optimistic. There is a large number of neural circuits that we are on the verge of being able to manipulate, things that govern states like fear, anxiety, terror, and depression. We don't have recipes yet to control them, but the potential is clearly foreseeable. It would absolutely astonish me if we didn't identify a range of pharmaceuticals that would be of great utility to interrogators.